All right, good morning, everyone. I am Janet Thompson. I'm with Janet Thompson Acupuncture and Herbal Medicine here in Oakland. And uh, my focus is pediatric health and women's health. And I recently connected with Amy Wheeler here with Los Angeles Brain Integration. And Amy focuses on addressing dyslexia and other learning challenges. And so our intent today is to talk um, maybe a, a, a tiny bit about my work and mostly about her work um, as she's doing traveling clinics up to the Bay Area and is now um, about to be working with, uh, with our wonderful children here in the Bay Area. So uh, Amy, I'd like to turn it over to you to talk a little bit about the work that you're doing. Thank you, Janet. <clears throat> hi, everybody, and hi to everyone who will be listening to this as a recording. I'm Amy Wheeler of Los Angeles Brain Integration. My website, if you want more information or to contact me, is losangelesbrainintegration.com. Kind of a long website, I know. <laughs> um, I'm very excited to say I'll be coming to Oakland to work at Janet's clinic on July 27th, 28th, 29th, 30th, 2020. And um, I still have a few more slots open if anyone ends up being interested. And um, I'm planning to make this an ongoing thing, so I'll be coming back. Um, I do something called the Brain Integration Technique. For short, I call it BIT. B, brain, I, integration, T, technique, BIT, brain integration technique. Um, and it's an acupressure and neuroscience-based method that specializes in treating learning challenges. I happen to specialize in dyslexia. That just sort of happened because that was the client base that ended up coming to me. But it also helps with auditory processing, sensory processing, balance, coordination, concentration, memory, working memory. What am I forgetting? Oh, speech and articulation. So um, lots of stuff. Um, and I'm going to talk about reading and sort of all the things that have to happen and have to be online for reading to work. Um, and this is one reason I was really interested in working with Janet because she has an undergraduate degree in neuroscience. Is that yes. right? Yeah. Yes. So, so we tend to take reading for granted. If we can do it, it seems easy. It just happens, but there's so much that has to be online for it to happen. First of all, your body sort of has to be in a calm and collected and relaxed place. You can't be in fight or flight. You can't, can't be freaked out. You have to be calm and receptive. Next, your vestibular system has to be enough uh, online to hold your head still. You can't be dizzy, so that has to be online. Um, your eyes have to be able to take in data well. I have a lot of clients who have perfect vision. You know, they have 20-20 vision. They've gone to the eye doctor. Vision is fine. But what I'm really looking at is how are the eye muscles working together? Um, in order for reading to happen, there's a lot of things that have to happen, but two particularly important things are the eyes have to be able to converge. That means the eyes have to slightly cross to look at the page or the screen. And if the two different eyes are converging on different letters, there's some data, data information that's not working. The other thing that happens is the eyes need to be able to track really smoothly, go back and forth on the page. Um, I did this method on my son and I dis when he was about five, and I discovered that for him, he couldn't move, his, his vision was perfect, but he couldn't move his eye muscles without a lot of effort. In fact, he told me at one point, if I want my eyes to move, I have to steer it with my tongue, and he would go. Mm -hmm. So, you want the eye muscles to be working well. And then once the data, the sensory data flows in from the eyes to the brain, there's all the different parts of the brain that have to be coordinated and working well together. Um, the little squiggles have to be translated into letters. Those letters have to be combined into words, the words into sentences, the sentences into paragraphs, that all has to make sense. Once we read that, we have to remember what we read a few paragraphs ago or yesterday, so there's short and long-term memory issues. Um, and then after that, if we're in a classroom, especially, um, we have to be able to formulate our own thoughts about that. 
and then have that come out of our mouth in an articulate fashion. And you know, our, our tongue and our lips have to be able to speak those words smoothly. So in short, there's this huge long sequence of little events that, and all the information has to be happening smoothly in order for reading to happen. And so what I'm doing as I'm looking at all those little steps and making sure that the information is flowing smoothly and correcting or doing, doing what I call a balance in order to facilitate the smooth flow of information. Um, let's see. So when I see someone with a learning challenge, basically I see, oh, hello, there you are. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't your realize face. it wasn't <laughs> until a minute ago. I'm just sitting there nodding to everything you're saying. <laughs> okay. Um, so for learning, for me, learning challenges are symptoms of like an underlying wiring issue in the brain. And my job is to find where that wiring issue is and then do a balance on it. Um, I'll talk about my treatment protocol. Um, for, on average, it takes eight to 10 hours. Um, that'll be a lot longer if there's way more issues on the kid, of course, but on average, that's what I do, how long it takes. Um, the first 20 minutes usually are, a, it's a real brief assessment. I have the person read, I have the person do um, a sh little short memory test. I look at how their eyes move. Um, I see how their balance and coordination is. And it's really important for me that when I'm evaluating the kid, uh, my first goal is to establish rapport and not make them feel evaluated. You both know how many kids have been treated as problems. They're unconfident. They have people talking over their head um, so I, I, I never talk about the kid in front of the child over their head. I schedule a phone call separately with the parent for us to have those discussions. And um, it's really important for me to make that child feel respected and capable. So um, a lot of times what I'll do is if I'll, I'll tell them, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you do something that's hard. You tell me if it's hard, easy, or medium. And we sort of make it a game. And if something is kind of hard for them, we back up and we do something that's easy. So they end up sort of smiling and thinking more as a game instead of as feeling evaluated, if that makes sense. Um, and then after that initial assessment, which gives me, which gives me an idea of, what their needs are, how long it'll take. It also establishes benchmarks that we revisit at the end of the treatment to make sure it actually worked. <laughs> um, then we go straight into treatment. I s work sort of from the base up, the way that you'd build a house. You start with a foundation, then you do the walls, then you do the roof. So we're working like on the limbic system and in a very fundamental way, how information is flowing into the brain. We work to make sure that the corpus callosum is um, getting data to the right and the left side of the brain's brain. Um, and that's usually two or three hours of treatment. Then we start working on eyes and ears how information is coming in. That's when I look at the eye muscle and do corrections on that. And also whether or not it's flowing well through the cranial nerves to the various parts of the brain that need to be um, working well. And then um, we do sound, make sure that sound comes in well and that we can, that the person knows, well, I won't, I'll just say that we work on sound. That's usually pretty brief. Then we do balance and movement. Once we do the balance and movement, we're sort of done with the first part of the brain integration. That part is almost, the part I just described, all those steps, it's almost like a checklist that I just run down. I'm making sure that all these parts are functional. Whenever they're not functional, I do a balance. Um, and it's sort of like the equivalent of taking your car to the shop and someone you know, fixes up your engine, looks and makes sure that everything is working well. The next part of brain integration is like the equivalent of taking that car out for a test drive. We see how it actually works on the road. So I'm asking the person to revisit the things that we did in the beginning, reading, the memory, 
And um, at that point, I'm seeing how the person functions as they do those things. And again, balancing anything I see that's not working. Um, and we also do any needs that are particular to the client. So sometimes that's when speech and articulation would come out, come in. And you guys both probably know this with speech and articulation. There's two issues. It's whether or not the motor control of the mouth and the lips, the throat, all these areas are communicating accurately with the brain. And then there's also a hearing component. Somebody who is hearing a sound incorrectly will mispronounce it incorrectly. So I've, I've found that's true with a lot of my clients that they're actually hearing it incorrectly. And so of course they're saying it wrong. Um, and that's it, that's the brain integration process. Um, it's an acupressure modality. So I'm very gently touching the body, mostly on the upper torso and the face. And it's sort of like the equivalent of you putting in a point formula, Janet. Um, and then once I have that in, I, I do, this is, it's sort of this motion to the client. So I do this a lot throughout, I'm touching their head. And that's the part where I do a balance. Um, and I'm sort of, I'm waiting for the chi to make a circuit. So you can relate to that. And I can actually feel the pulses once they get coordinated in both hands. I know that the balance has taken place. And then we redo whatever I have just done to confirm that there's not a little bit more that we need to balance and just to make sure that it's actually, it's actually works. So there's a lot of like double checking that happens. Um, let me check my notes and see if I, what I wanted to talk about next. Is this something that would be, would be lasting effects or is this a treatment that needs to be repeated? Forgive my ignorance. That's a good question. Good question. It's not like going to a chiropractor where you need to maintain once a week or something like that. Or like going to the car repair shop where you do need to, I mean, you need to go yeah. get your up periodically. Right, right, right. There, I mean, I do say, I mean, life goes on. So I do say that it's good. Once kids have this treatment, it should be good. Yeah. But, yeah. but just because life is complicated and it's related to stress and all the, and maturity and the brain changes. Yeah. Um, I do think that there needs to be like sort of a follow up, like, I don't know, once a year, it kind of depends on the person. Uh -huh. okay. And to go back to your question, when I work with kids on the spectrum, it's mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. Kids on the spectrum, you do this whole treatment, you wait six to eight weeks, you sort of let it gel, and then you do the whole treatment again, mm -hmm. and you will have seen that there's a whole bunch of growth and balances I couldn't have done six or eight weeks ago, suddenly I can do. But that's an example of someone who Would has a lot work. more to do. They're, they're going to be longer than eight to 10 hours because there's just more going on. Okay. Yeah, they usually have reading issues, auditory issues, sensory yeah. issues and coordination issues. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, all right, should I talk about quickly about a couple case studies or do you have any more questions about what I've already said? I, yeah. I'm actually curious about what ages you typically work with. Like when are you getting kids in? Is it, a, is it all through or you're mainly working with younger children or? Whoever comes to me, I also treat adults. Uh -huh. um, I mean, in the perfect world, if I was boss of the world, I would be they come early. <laughs> yeah, they would come like when they're five or six so that they didn't have three years of being like the dumb kid in class or, you know, I, I forget what word you used, Regina. What, I wrote it down because it was so accurate a phrase. Oh, too late. You said sometime too late. So, I mean, sometimes it does, I, I get teenagers and they have this preconception oh, I'm bad at reading. And they also don't want to learn to read because why would you want to learn to do something you hate? Like, I hate bananas. If someone said, I'll make you love bananas, I'd be like, so what? I don't, you know, I, I'm sort of exaggerating to make a point, but the younger, the better, you know? Um, but, mm -hmm. but it's also very effective on adults. I mean, I've, I've had adult dyslexics come to me and um, if they're motivated and they want to do it, it helps them. Amy, maybe you're about to address this in your case study, so you can tell me to put this question on pause. 
Um, but I'm curious to know, um, for children for whom there's a large either behavioral or attention component, is there other pre-work that needs to be done or are there certain ways you need to, or major ways in which you need to adjust what you're doing or you just maybe the pace is a little bit different or the spacing of treatments is a little different? Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. So if I'm not, let me know. But um, I, I take people, whoever comes to me, we have a discussion. I decide whether or not I think it's going to be helpful. But this is not a standalone treatment. You know, any kid, especially someone who has ADD, ADHD types of issues, there's going to be a nutritional component. Um, there's often a parenting component. Um, tutors are really helpful, how they're learning, support in the classroom. I mean, another really interesting difference I get is between kids who have learning difficulties who are homeschooled and who are in typical school. The kids who are homeschooled, they don't, they're happy with right where they are. You know, they, they don't have the sort of baggage of how they're perceived. So actually those kids are a lot easier to work with um, in terms of their self-confidence. Um, so yeah, I, this is not a standalone treatment. It's much easier for me to work with people who have already done the nutritional piece, already addressed allergies, um, who are really clued in about their parenting. But if people come to me and they haven't done that, I still figure that I will help them as much as they can and make recommendations um, of them. For example, visiting a pediatric acupuncturist who can help them with candida issues. Yes. <laughs> okay. No, that, that totally helps. And then also I assume that you, you know, for kids who have trouble, have, do have attention problems, for example, that you might do some of the treatments in shorter chunks or something to accommodate. Oh, absolutely. Ability. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's one of the things we always discuss with the parents. How long can your kids sit still? Right. You know, when I work with a four or five year old, we do like half hour appointments. The parents bring toys, you know, we try and we develop a strategy that's particular to that person. Great. Um, may I ask a question? Of course. I'm interested in when you said broadly like 20 hours, 20 hours, are you, so that's breaking that up into one hour segments or half hour segments based on sessions, based on what the kid, what works for the kid. Correct. Okay. So the other thing that's interesting to me is you discussing convergence, what functional MRIs and um, where, how the brain lights up when you need to get um, so much more of the brain lights up when you ask for speech to come into play, you know? So to read silently, it's actually processing is quicker than when you ask for all of this to be involved, you know, so much more. Yeah. So what we're talking about is neurocircuitry. And mm -hmm. the reason why it sticks is when you, you actually redefine the neurocircuitry for the convergence issue, which is one of the few, there's a lot of controversy, you know, about this vision stuff, but NIH, Mayo Clinic, they're all on board with the convergence issue, which is great. Um, but what's interesting to me is I'm wondering, so does the act say I do exercises with kids and the whole idea is that we do these exercises that actually help instead of the kid moving their whole head across the page to just move their eyes, you know, for tracking mm -hmm. in terms of convergence to have there be sustained convergence because unconsciously then their eyes pull out. Mm -hmm. No one understands that, that. And then the kid is reading great for the first paragraph or two, but then well, can't sustain it. And then right, it's really of evident of yeah. course, when the kid is very bright and they can read big font you know, and then all of a sudden fourth grade, the font gets a lot smaller. Right, right. You know, and that's, and then they have a problem for a year and then you finally get them when they're in fifth grade or something, uh, switched on, you know. So are, A, are you aware of what a visual efficiency exam is and from a developmental optometrist and what's, um, what's covered with that? A, I'm wondering if you know about a visual efficiency exam. B, in terms of it sticking, you know, I'm wondering if the acupressure work combined with then, ther then reading therapy with a therapist or, you know, a tutor, if that's what does the neuro recircuitry. For me, working with 
Dr. Grisham was a developmental, pedi um, developmental optometrist. What happens is that you're actually reprogramming the circuitry. And the reason why it works is because the amygdala gets involved, the limbic system is involved, because we really want it. You need both eyes to be working as efficiently as possible. And when I use the term efficient here, it's a whole nother ball game. We're not talking about efficiently, you know, going driving on errands or something. We're talking about hundreds of a second that add up. So mm -hmm. neurologically, to use the term efficient has a much greater weight. And I'm intrigued if the acupressure combined with, um, with the neurocircuitry, re, it's kind of redoing the neuro neurocircuitry. Once the neurocircuitry is kind of redone, that the brain goes there because it wants to see efficiently. And I'm wondering if the acupuncture, the acupressure actually, dare I say, speeds up that process. You know, because I'm used to it being, I do eye exercises with kids and being back on the heads and all this different stuff, looking far, looking near. You know, there are a whole lot of, there's a whole lot more to the vision piece. Mm -hmm. um, and how how the acupressure might speed up that process instead of it just being eye exercises. Right, right. Okay, so you said a whole bunch right there, and I hope that I address it in my question, in my answer to you, and if I don't, just let me know. Um, first of all, I'm going to take your course. I mean, say that I, again? Maybe I have to take your course, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, First of all, you're a scientist or know about this in a lot more scientific way than I do. So, um, yes, I'm, well, let's see. You asked me about, well, there's so much I don't know about different modalities, about what you do, about um, vision therapy. There's so much I don't know. And I typically work with people who have gone through these things. I see the two as complementary. Um, um, yeah. Oh, I totally do. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I'm just saying that there's a lot of terminology and stuff that I don't know. I'm sort of a much more casual uh, user of the language than you. Um, I'm just, I'm just pointing that out, I guess. Um, but in terms of the neural circuitry, the way I sort of envision it is that if I do an acupressure balance, I'm opening up a neural pathway. And then what has to happen in order for it to be nice and strong and become habituated is myelination. Um, it, it needs to be ex like the kinds of exercises it sounds like you're doing. Or, or somehow or other that needs to be turned into a rich, firm pathway that is different than the old pathway. Right. Does that make, does that make sense? Totally. Yeah, yeah. That, that, so. Totally. I mean, what, but what I'm intrigued by combining the acupressure element. Exactly. What, what I think can happen is the speed with yes. which part, myelination in part, I mean, that's a, like tiny part of it. But the, but the neurocircuitry, I'm intrigued if the acupressure work enhances and speeds up the new neurocircuitry or the balance or the channel, whatever phrase we want to use, um, having that be established. Because the key is having it established so, and then the brain goes there naturally on its own. Yeah. It doesn't revert back. Yeah. M my sense is yes, that it does that. And I'll give you another example. Um, cool. Have you heard of the program Fast Forward? Yes, very much Okay. So. Okay, so. Um, I don't use it, but I've heard of it. Okay, so I've worked with clients, and one of them was my own son, who were doing the fast forward, and they would get stuck on one place. There was a, a, like a, a tone thing for my son, and he just couldn't hear the tones. And after a couple weeks of just like doing it over and over and staying in the same spot, I was like, well, why don't I try doing an acupressure balance on it? Bingo. And then it, it opened up that pathway and then he was able to do it and he still had to practice it, but he went to the next level. So it sort of like opened the door. I just that's, love the mind. That's how I think about it. it. makes perfect sense. Okay. And then I just, my one last question is you were speaking about balancing the chi and feeling it. Is it different if you have a kid that's an ADD kid that's on meds or not? Can you feel a difference if they're on the meds or not? You know, the energy flow. Um, that's a good question. 
or when they last took the meds or whatever. I yeah. would just find that an, an intriguing um, yeah. sensing thing. And maybe it would be me, my ability to sense, did I have, a, do I have a cup of coffee on board or not? You know, I mean, I want to look at my <laughs> makeup. And yeah, um, I would say no. I mean, it does, I mean, what I really uh, noticed though is um, if the kids have eaten something they were allergic to, uh -huh. okay. um, then it's sort of like their body is just not, it makes, it makes everything more sluggish for me. It seems like the whole thing takes longer. And also they're often wiggling around. So I have to like chase them around the room or something like that. Yeah, but yeah. what's your perspective on that, Janet? Because I'd say the same question. would apply. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm nodding a lot. Um, I, I see the same thing. And I would say I get a lot of questions from parents. So I, I work with um, similar populations, but I don't do the direct kind of work that Amy does. So I have children with ADHD uh, and children on the spectrum in the clinic. And I the first question I usually get is, is it okay that my child is already on medication? Will this still help? Um, and, and inevitably the answer is yes, um, it, it does still help. And it, every child is different, so, so there are a lot of ifs and ands. Um, but I would absolutely agree that if there are other distractors such as allergies, um, which can cause systemic inflammation or can just drain the body's energy, maybe directly to the gut or directly to the skin or wherever the allergy is manifesting, it slows the ability for the body and the brain to function in the normal way. Um, so yes, I would imagine in the same exact way, Amy, that you're, it's going to take longer to feel like, oh yes, the energy is coming to this part of the head, to this part of the head. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's slower to make change overall until you can get some of those distractors cleared away and then all of a sudden the body really rapidly responds. Yeah, yeah, well said, yeah. <clears throat> Interesting question, thanks. Yeah. Amy, did you wanna cover a couple case studies and then we'll do some more Q&A? Yes, let's do that. Um, all right, so I'm gonna talk about Jay. She was a third grader that came to me. She was a very bright kid, did really, really well in math, very articulate, but um, was, d just couldn't read uh, very well. So she was in the lowest, she was in um, private school. She was in um, the lowest reading levels. And she was doing that thing where she would just read the first, like if there was if the word behind, she would just read the first B. E -E, and then just stab, take a guess, because before you guys know what I'm talking about. Yes, and go technique. <laughs> yeah, so she would do that. And then also her comprehension was really low. And then this is something you guys will also know about. If I read something to her, her comprehension was like 95, 100%, really high because it was coming in through her ears. It was auditory. If she read it out loud to herself, it was a little bit harder. Um, but she would have a higher comprehension. If she read it herself, silently to herself, her comprehension would drop way down. She just couldn't get the information through her eyes. So um, we did the treatment. She was, I think, about seven hours. No, she was eight, eight or nine hours, but we also did a lot of speech and articulation stuff. Um, and She, let's see, it was probably like two or three months after we, uh, like reading started becoming easy, easier for her after the treatment. But then within two or three months, because there's often sort of a delayed response, because I'm working on such a kind of fundamental level, you know, reading's not a switch that you turn on and off. Within two or three months, you know, her mom and I checked in and she was like, oh my God, in her free time, I look in her bedroom and she's reading a book. You know, so actually like reading, on my website, I have like the tagline, reading can become easy and fun. And she's like the classic case of someone who just started always carrying a book around with her, just loved reading and got to delve into that world, that wonderful world of books and imagination. So she's kind of a, a, a typical client for me. I get a lot of people like that. Um, then I'm going to talk about another kid, D. Let's see. When he came to me, he hadn't been diagnosed, but his symptoms were, like he was on the spectrum, high functioning. He was in the classroom, but he had a lot of pullouts. He had to be pulled out a lot. 
Um, and he had atypical expressive and receptive language. So when you talked, he had a really hard time keeping up with the flow of conversation. If you talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, hey, how are you today? It was like you could literally count one, two, three, and then he would respond. Um, so we had this long delay. It was like, yeah, the, the information just wasn't flowing in very easily. Um, he had sort of a wooden tone and expression. He was confused by social interactions. He couldn't read facial tone. I mean, facial, like nonverbal cues and um, tone and very poor coordination. You guys might be familiar with this, with kids on the spectrum. Like they want the so solid ground under their feet. Um, they don't want to get onto a swing. They don't want to climb onto anything. Um, getting on a scooter or a bike. Um, is terrifying. He could read very well mechanically, but the comprehension just wasn't there. There was no comprehension. Um, oh, and he was terrified of spiders. If he saw a spider, he would just, like his whole day was ruined. He was terrified of spiders. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked on him for a total of 17 hours. And then I did that thing I mentioned earlier. We just let it sit for six to eight weeks. Um, but even after that 17 hours, this is just something I was going through my notes and I found this, I'd sort of forgotten about it, but this is what his mother said after the 17 hours. Since working with Amy, we have noticed that our son's expressive and receptive language challenges have both improved. For example, in conversation, he's always paused before answering a question or taking his turn talking. The length of this pause has decreased by more than half. He also seems to be asking what? less frequently. He's telling us more about his day now and in more expressive, energetic way and with details. He and I, his mom, listen to audiobooks at night and I ask him who, what, when, where questions Great. about what we listen to. He's greatly improved in this area, answering strings of questions precisely and with far more detail than before. He is more engaged in everything now. He is far more willing to try or do new things. For example, his swim teacher just pointed out that he no longer says no before trying something new, such as diving into the pool. He just does it. His default with new things used to be no, and those who knew him would have to try to convince him to do it. He, oh, it has also been his idea to do art lately, and he has been putting a lot of time and focus in it, into it. He doesn't mind having a messy work area, which was something that always bothered him before. He is also trying more activities which involve coordination. For example, climbing over a fence because it looked like an interesting thing to do or throwing and catching various toys. He often seems surprised and happy about the new things he is able to do. Oh, wow. So, oh. That's yeah, amazing. wow. So those are, those are just little tiny changes in a person's life that just have incredible consequences for their future. So, uh -huh. yes. May I ask um, two things I realized I wanted to, to go back. One question was for the, the prior one where there was that girl in third grade where the focus was clearly pretty visual. I just want to know what you identified and worked on with her with the visual. Was it convergence? Do you work on the difference between far vision and near vision? I'm just curious about that yeah. and what you did that got such a great response. And then with this kid, what other um, therapeutic supports was okay. he getting that okay. coordinated because you, you know, that's a pretty huge response. I mean, yes. it's great. You know, I'm yeah. just wondering. Yeah. Was he also doing occupational therapy? Was he, you know, was it during the summer where he had a lot more physical stuff going on than maybe he had at school? I mean, I, yeah. I'm curious as to the whole package. Although, yeah, there's always, there's always lots of pieces to the puzzle. And it's always going to be kind of hard to tease out what did what. Yeah. With, with um, this particular kid, it was during the school year. We did do it pretty consistently. And he had been doing all the other therapies someone like this would be doing, occupational, um, IEP, IEP support. I forget all the therapies, but those had been ongoing way before me, and they continued. Um, so I was sort of the new factor in there. 
So I feel like the acupressure. You I mean, help he, them integrate. You help them integrate. Yes, perfectly said. Um, yeah, yeah. Term right, help them right, integrate. right. Okay. So I couldn't have done all of that on my own, um, but I helped take it to the next level. Is my belief. Was he resistant to you touching him? Not at all. He wasn't. He okay. wasn't. Yeah. He was a really friendly, open, warm kid. He really wanted to be engaged with people, that particular boy. Um, and then in terms of the girl, I don't have my notes in front of her, in front of me about her. Um, but yes, I do also work on near far vision. And I mean, I work in a really different way from you. I'm working on a check from a checklist. I'm putting in neural pathways. I'm making people do things. And then I, it's like, I almost, I can't really tell necessarily what I'm fixing. I might be able to tell the particular area of the brain, the brain. Um, let's see if I can explain that. Um, I, it's almost you're like the way you, you're saying you go, you go through a series of protocols and you're not necessarily saying, okay, I'm targeting this part of the brain. When I do the protocol, I'm just doing the protocol and then watching if, what the result is. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So it's sort of me more too. like the way I, I use <laughs> Say that again. I was just going to say me too. I'm oh, okay. Why, I mean, I, I know what I'm, whatever. Me, me too. I mean, we can, okay. it's just, I mean, are you kidding? The brain is so complicated. Exactly. exactly. You know, we, it's a little overwhelming. Arrogant if we thought we were being yeah. that precise. However, right. you can test and is the tracking better? Is the convergence yes, better? Yes, and I do do Those that. Things you can, to, you know, absolutely, precisely because it is all inherently integrated. When you're working on one thing, you know, you're working on everything. Yes. However, yeah. if you strengthen, identify, and strengthen individual pieces, it's interesting, and it can be a couple of weeks or months, and then it goes. Could once yeah. they're all individually strengthened, it kind yep. of goes could chunk, could chunk. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. when I but but also to go back to your question, when I am working on the eyes, the eyes are kind of fun because you know we'll be doing the tracking. We also do I just call it near far vision. Um, we do eye circles. We do all sorts of things. But yeah. as I'm working with the people, I'm asking them, you know, really keep in touch with me. Like if I ask you to converge your eyes, does it give you a headache? Or, you know, you can just sort of notice the kid starts doing this and you're like, oh, that's causing eye strain. And so uh -huh. when you do the balance, they can give you immediately, immediate feedback. Oh, it doesn't hurt anymore. Or, you know, sometimes I have to wait a week till the next appointment and we retest that and we see whether or not the same eye strain comes up. So there is, there are ways to measure it immediately. Does that make sense? Yeah, I have about 32 questions based on that one thing you said, but we'll do that later. Okay, yeah, we can talk again, yeah. It's very interesting for you to work with a developmental optometrist. They're kind of a horse of a different color, these people. Because yes, you yes. Can get, you know, you can buy these fabulous machines that basically really measure, you know, mm -hmm. the spherical, convex, concave, you know, the eye. And then you, and I mean, just the difference between contact lenses and glasses that's like three miles between your eyes and yes, that. Yes, you know yes, yes. i mean you know so that's why you get different prescriptions mm -hmm. contacts versus glasses mm -hmm. you know because mm -hmm. neurologically it's huge difference but that anyway just so so there's sight and then there's vision and sight for me is here and vision is taking in the rest mm. of the occipital that's, that's well put yeah and that's then well how put. it um to use a clinical term, then when you activate that part of the occipital cortex and that points around in the brain to then have those squiggles turn into meaning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I find I'm intrigued. I'm just intrigued that when you say, well, if we would balance it like in one or two sessions, that something could be that rapidly balanced or that the neurocircuitry could be that rapidly reestablished and that it's the acupressure element that seems to be the different component here for me. Yeah. And, and Regina, I'm intrigued. Everything you say just gets me increasingly interested. Yeah, I would say, um, in, in my experience, some of what's happening, so some of the points, 
some of the acupuncture acupressure points that are on the occiput are also known for being calming. So when you're using them in practice generally, um, you may use points at the back of the head here to calm a child who's got nervous system upset. Right. And so I wonder if some of what is happening with the work that Amy's doing on the front and the back concurrently is especially effective because the child is getting calmed at the same time as some of that visual circuitry is getting strengthened. Mm. And so it has sort of a, what's that? <laughs> like logarithmic uh, improvement, if you it know that. It makes perfect sense. In some ways, it's like mainlining the integration. That, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yes. I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fascinating. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I feel like I, right now I'm working with a client who um, has a very long assessment from someone who must be doing some of the kind of work that is similar to what you're doing, Regina. So I have like a chart of how the eye moves when it tracks and all sorts of things that seem like they're, they, it just seems like that they're very good tools for the kind of work that I'm doing. And that I, I'm, I am curious with finding out how I could partner with that type of information and knowledge to make what I do better and what, you know, to, to to, to work as a partner. I'm so excited to learn more uh, from you. All right, well, let's talk more. Yeah, you guys should schedule one. Yeah. Profile. Here we go. Sorry, I don't mean to take so much time with this. I'm no, just... it's, it's no, these great. are great questions. These are great questions. It's uh, making the recording more interesting. Yeah, and that's that's oh, part of what we wanted to do. We're recording. Okay. <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. Um, part of what we want to do by having these kinds of meetings is help people see um, what the connections are, because a lot of times people are familiar with one specialty or two specialties, but not six or eight. And so trying to figure out which ones are the best for their child that work well together is, is helpful. So I think this conversation is super helpful. Yeah, me too. Um, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, Clara and oh, yeah. any other questions? That I actually do have a couple of questions that are going to take it off a little bit because, <clears throat> as I say, excuse me, <clears throat> I shouldn't have, I should have cleared my throat before I started. Um, I, mostly I'm working with an older population that is the ideal to get started at this. So, mm -hmm. but I'm very intrigued about the possibilities here. So I'm curious, when you do work with students who are older, um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of one kid I'm, I, I have an ongoing relationship with and that I've worked with for years now who came in to me with something that instantly looked like dyslexia, but the parents swore dyslexia had been ruled out. So it was, it's been a really long process to finally get him tested clearly in a way because I thought, well, maybe it's auditory. There is a big auditory component. But there's a lot of other stuff to me seems physical and seems it, it, it he's on the brink of now becoming, you know, he's going to be applying for schools. And I, I, you know, honestly, they're talking about UCs and I'm like, you're not going to make it. And you, you're, that is not the right school for you to go without some serious effort. He could do it, but the students I've seen that have achieved way beyond their levels have far greater resources in terms of will than this kid's has. So I'm curious, and the parents are on a, a fixed budget, so I've got a couple of questions. Do you work on a fixed fee? Do you, dealing with a student like this, which has, who you know, has the IEP and the whole neuropsych workup that's finally been done, finally, finally, finally got done um, a year or so ago, because I said he has to have those accommodations for the testing in particular, mm. the standardized mm -hmm. testing. Mm -hmm. But a kid like this, I'm, I think depressed, overeating, un, under, way under motivated, the baby in the family so spoiled in some ways, you know, that he doesn't really have to get in there. And I'm not, I'm not even sure I could get the parents to go for it. <laughs> I could, for, for students like that, where you've got, this is a much older kid, mm -hmm. there's already a, a certain amount of scar tissue built mm -hmm. up, although the family's a good family, he's got a good family. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, is how effective is the kind of thing 
really either one of you, either you, Janet, or you, Amy, are doing in, with, with older children, because that would be mainly who I would be mm -hmm. seeing and maybe thinking about this for. Yeah. Um, I've worked with a lot of older children and it's been effective for them. I made that comment earlier about being boss of the world and having people come in earlier. That's just in the ideal situation. No, of course. And I yeah. agree with that. Yeah. Um, this isn't my student. student yeah. Knowledge. Yeah. So, you know, it's just that there's more factors. So it sort of feels like the success rate gets lower or, you know, because, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. but it, but it can be really, really effective. Even for, like I said, I've treated adults too. It kind of depends on the individual motivation, parenting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if someone's coming to me and they're depressed and not super motivated, um, sometimes I can help with that and sometimes I can't. I mean, there's another piece that I do at the end that I didn't mention that I call de-stressing. And um, that's sort of like an emotional balance component that I do where I just uh, sort of invite the, per the client's body to let go of preconceived notions uh -huh. around various topics. That sometimes doesn't do a thing. Sometimes it's mind-blowingly effective. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So um, I had one student who was in middle school or who wanted to go to middle school. He had always been homeschooled. He couldn't, he literally could not be in a classroom with other kids because he would like end up under the table. Uh -huh. um, he, yeah, anyway. Um, and just after a, 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 like half hour of emotional balances, he, he was able to go to middle school. Um, he still had a lot of learning challenges, but he was able to be in a classroom. Was a piece. And there was nothing else that that, I mean, the, the parent and I were very specific. There's nothing else at the time that that kid was doing. He had had a lot of other therapies, but there was literally the only thing that happened. So again, that, so, so sometimes it's very profoundly effective and other times it, it's, it's not. not yeah. yeah. And I would, I would say from my perspective, Clara, sometimes there's a little bit of a chicken and an egg thing. So if it's, if it's like he's gotten sort of depressed and therefore overeating and other stuff because he's so frustrated about the learning challenges, then maybe that's the entry point. But on the other hand, if he's the kind of child, and I know we had talked about this a little bit, if he is the kind of child who is, his body overall is a little sluggish, he doesn't have a lot of will, he doesn't have a lot of oomph that yeah. may be contributing to the learning problems and also results in a sort of low psycho-emotional state. And so yeah. if you work on that piece yeah. first or concurrently, then all of a sudden, all of this. Yeah. And now the second, the second possibility is I would judge more what's going on here. You yeah. know, there's just yeah. a, the, just, and as, as I say, I don't think necessarily being the youngest <laughs> kid in this family helps him out because yeah. I think he's been kind of gotten things done a lot. So yeah. anyway, yeah. thank you. Thank you both. It's very interesting, very, very interesting. And I'll keep it in mind for anybody that kind of hoves into view because I'm, I'm, uh, and, and one other question, Amy, when you, again, back to the money thing, which is, you know, often a concern for people. So, oh, yeah. if, so you obviously, if somebody's going to sign up for this, it would make sense for them to sign up for the whole, however long you think it might be. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't make sense to, to approach it like, well, we're going to do an hour here and see how right. it goes. Like you, yeah. So, yeah. Do you, are you basically saying to people, okay, I anticipate this will take eight to 10 hours and here's what it's going to cost you, um, or you're more open ended than that? Or I, it, this is the sort of thing anybody I recommend this to is going to want sure. <laughs> as a general um, thing, and you could handle it obviously more, but just. They, they, that's one of the first questions people will ask. Yeah. Um, I mean, my rate is 125 an hour and I've always just been flat. Yeah. I'm I charge that. I and flat rate. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's just. And then it, as part of that assessment, that first 20 minutes assessment, I give parents an estimate of uh -huh. how long I anticipate that it'll take this long. It's only an estimate because. Of course. Yeah. yeah I um, get that. No, yeah. I totally, I totally, totally get that. I totally yeah. get it. So. Yeah. And, and then basically working, like, let's say you have, this would probably not be relevant for anybody I might be sending to you, but you don't, or that I might be recommending to talk to you. Obviously, most of these kids are at the age I'm talking about, you're going to do an hour session at a time. You wouldn't be needing to break it down into half hours like you did with the 
the little kids that you were talking about. I, again, that is really something that I would decide with the parents. I think that there probably are out there in the world some older kids who could only handle 45 minutes. Okay, and and then there's, there's some that can handle three hours at once. So. Okay, and so how often, let's say we are talking about a sort of classic hour, how, how often would you see them? Is it oh, once a week, multiple times a week? Depends. Okay, that's a good question. Um, that again is something that's highly customizable. I think that in terms of seeing results, it's mm -hmm. better to do it quick uh -huh, uh -huh. because then the parent sees results, the kid sees results. It's sort of easier to stay motivated. But in uh -huh. terms of the actual healing or changes that occur, theoretically speaking, I could do one hour appointments with two years in between. Uh -huh. And at the end, we would still come to relatively the same point. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, well, well, are there any more questions? I guess one other question that I have, and I think I understand the answer to this. You, basically what I think you're saying is, if there's an ADD, ADHD piece involved in this, which there very often is with this set of problems, as I'm sure you know, that's a separate issue, different issue, complicating factor. Um, I, I don't really know how to answer that question, but I will say this. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's really I, like labels are sort of useful and sort of not useful. Mm -hmm. I mean, they sort of mm -hmm. tell me, give me a general idea of what the person is. And, and yeah, they all sort of overlap. Um, with people who have come to me with identifying themselves as ADD or ADHD, typically, I think that is, it's often genetic. So often the parents have yeah. similar symptoms. Um, there's often an allergy component. Um, often the kids are not eating very well. I've just had less luck with that population. People who are coming to me straight with that, di that diagnosis. Um, so I think what you're saying is if that, if that diagnosis is in with all the other stuff, the auditory processing, memory processing, dyslexia, LBLD, whatever it is, but that's not the presenting thing. That's not the thing they're coming and saying, I want help with. They're talking about this other stuff, but that happens to be a component. Yeah, that's it's a often a component. And if they come in saying, I want to, this is what I want to have. That, that, yeah, and thing. that's just been my experience. Okay. Um, that's just been my experience. That's, that's yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that may be, that may be a good partnering um, uh, opportunity, Amy. Um, yeah. Because when I work with the ADHD kids, I'm, I'm less looking at the neural circuitry in terms of um, visual and, and auditory and more just yeah. the nervous system stuff, um, whether it's an excitability component Absolutely. or not enough energy to be present um, yeah. and using herbs and acupuncture for that. So that may be a good, right. uh, you know, exactly. For, for that, I, I feel that. like that needs to be addressed simultaneously or prior to what I do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I actually think that all that needs to happen is the, the um, allergies need to be addressed. Yeah. Sometimes that's all that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. it's extremely so. interesting, all of it. Thank you. And thank I, you both. Oh, oh sorry, I have one, one more last question. question. Could, you give, could you just give a really brief arc as to what you do with your, the workshop? You know, do we get obviously, you know, some basic information, then do you get, do we get your checklist? Um, mm, okay. I give an arc of like, if I were to sign up for this, what can I walk in and expect? Okay. So what I'm, I'm coming to Janet's to treat kids. I have appointments with parents and kids to give the brain integration treatment. I won't be doing a workshop that's teaching it. I'm applying the method to clients. So sorry about if there's that misunderstanding. Clearly there was. That's okay. So that means we would sit in and watch you work or I guess I, I don't understand the workshop component or I don't understand how you working with these kids, how we could glean information. Oh, okay. So maybe the word workshop was, de was described to, to, to what we're doing right now, just to talk. Um, I, I have been calling it a traveling clinic. So I'm coming. So that's you working with kids. That's yeah. not you teaching yeah. practitioners. No, no, no. And, and no. in fact, you can't come into the room. Sorry. No, of course. I mean, yeah. that's highly, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, 
that's so I'm sorry about that misunderstanding. I don't know how that happened, but I apologize. Okay. No so workshop. there isn't any organized way yet for us to coordinate or for us to get more information from you in an organized presentation. You and I can talk informally. Yeah. Um, also, the person who taught me this method is named Susan McCrossan. She does teach this to people. And if you're interested in learning that, you and I could talk more and I can just tell you about that and point you in the right direction. Okay. Thank you kindly. Mm -hmm. I really admire your work and Janet and everyone. Thank you so much for coordinating this. Yes, thank you. You asked some fantastic questions. It was really interesting for me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both for participating. It made the dialogue a lot richer. Um, Amy, any other closing thoughts for this uh, webinar? I can't think of anything. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much. I'm, I'm bopping out of here now. I got to go on with my day, but I really appreciate it and I learned a lot. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, good. All right. Thank okay. you. Thank you very nice much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.